Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Quote, once again, seriously this time, can the Prime Minister tell us why he did not immediately demand that the Chief of Defence Staff resign? End quote. That was the Prime Minister's attitude in 2015 in reaction to comments made by General Tom Lawson. So once again, Mr. Speaker, seriously this time, can the Prime Minister tell us why he did not immediately demand that the Chief of Defence Staff resign when he learned of allegations against him in 2018? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we have always taken allegations of sexual misconduct very seriously. No one should ever feel unsafe at work. It is clear, though, that the many measures we have taken since being in government haven't yet gone far enough, and they haven't moved fast enough. As I said yesterday, we need to move faster, and we will do more. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Taken very seriously, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Michael Wernick, the former clerk of the Privy Council, has admitted he was aware of the allegations. Elder Marquez, the senior advisor to the Prime Minister, was made aware. In 2015, the Prime Minister told the House that sexual harassment in our military is unacceptable. So why was it acceptable for him to ignore it in 2018? Great Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. S Speaker, that's simply not true. We take all allegations seriously and ensure they are followed up on by the appropriate independent authorities. That's exactly what happened in this situation. After the Defence Ombudsman received a complaint, the Minister directed him to independent officials who could investigate. My office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman. Those officials never received further information and so were unable to move forward with an investigation. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister needs to demonstrate leadership. In 2015, inappropriate comments from the Chief of Defence Staff were enough for this Prime Minister to demand a resignation. In 2018, allegation of sexual misconduct itself wasn't even enough for him to demand an investigation. So which Prime Minister is it in 2021, Mr. Speaker? The one who demanded accountability in opposition or the one as Prime Minister who is supporting a cover-up? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have always taken allegations of sexual misconduct seriously and referred them to the appropriate authorities. When the Ombudsman came forward to the Minister to say uh, he had uh, heard allegations, the Minister directed him to those independent authorities who could follow up on an investigation. Those are the people who need to do the independent, rigorous investigations. We have always uh, ensure that those people are able to do the rigorous follow-ups. In this case, there was not enough information to continue with the independent investigation. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The rigorous follow-ups the Prime Minister is talking about in 2018, Mr. Speaker, everyone around this Prime Minister was aware of the sexual harassment allegations in 2018. Why in 2019? Did the Prime Minister extend the contract of the Chief of Defence Staff and give him a promotion? You're right, Honourable Prime Minister. In 2018, my office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman. But my office and I learned of the details of the allegation through news reporting over the past months. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker. The scientific head of the government, Pfizer, and the head of immunology have all said that the government's plan to give, to leave a four month period between the two doses will make Canada more vulnerable to COVID-19 variants. Why is this liberal government ignoring the advice of scientific experts? The right honorable prime minister, Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, and unlike the Conservatives, we have listened to scientists at every step. Now, 
We have safe and effective vaccines in Canada, and so we need to ensure that as many Canadians as possible can be vaccinated. To ensure that this is the case and to ensure that as many people as possible are protected, the National uh, Committee on Immunization has declared that the second dose can be pushed back by four months safely. We will always continue to work with the provinces and territories and experts to ensure that our citizens are protected. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday in an interview, the current member for Longueuil, Shalom 1, explained that the government voted against Parliament's will to increase uh, old age security by $110 a month because it would be unfair for lower income seniors. Now, this is after, during the election campaign, the Liberals uh, said that uh, they would increase the age to 75. So is the government questioning the universal universality of the old age security system in Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, we've always been there to support our seniors. We increased the GIS by 10% once we came to power. We have supported seniors through other programs. We have broadened and reformed the Canadian pension system for seniors. We have invested and will continue to invest as promised in order to increase uh, pensions for seniors over 75. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Parliamentarians knew all of these things when they voted for uh, increasing OAS. The Prime Minister hasn't answered the question. Now, seniors have worked their entire lives. They need to have a basic minimum, minimum income. And yet, every year, every month, their income and their purchasing power is reduced because of the pandemic. The Prime Minister is refusing to, to increase the amount. Now, this is a very clear and important question. Do this Prime Minister and government want to compromise the universality of the old age security system? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we support seniors of all ages during the pandemic. We've given them non uh, non-taxable payments uh, totaling $3.8 billion, and we have provided additional community support as well. We are going to be increasing OAS for ten, by 10% for those 75 and older, and this is in addition to the work that we're doing to bring the age of eligibility, for, uh, changing the age of eligibility, increasing GIS for those living alone, and other programs. We will continue to be there for our seniors. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government tabled documents to a very important committee in English only. This is unacceptable. The government has all of the resources necessary to ensure that documents are tabled in both official languages. So my question is, why is the Prime Minister treating the French language like a second-class language? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, what the leader of the NDP is suggesting here is simply false. We provided uh, millions of documents as requested, or thousands of documents rather, and the committee received uh, them in both official languages. So the process is working correctly. We will always protect both of our official languages across this country. Member for Burnaby South. We're coming upon the first year anniversary of COVID-19, and it has been a very difficult year for so many people. But what is so heartbreaking about this pandemic is how seniors bore the brunt of it, particularly seniors in long-term care. And we've learned that seniors in for-profit long-term care experienced the worst conditions and were most likely to lose their lives. New Democrats have long said that there is no place for profit in the care of our seniors. Will the Prime Minister commit to removing profit from long-term care? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have committed to working with the provinces and territories to ensure that seniors are protected right across the country in long-term care. Uh, we know there is a need to improve long-term care standards across the country. and We look forward to working with the provinces and territories to share best practices. In the case of seniors, we have stepped up as a government with uh, more than $3.8 billion in tax-free payments to seniors, along with enhanced community support. We're committed to 
increasing the old age security by 10 percent for seniors 75 and up. And that builds on our work of increasing the GIS, uh, increasing uh, Pe Canada Pension Plan for future retirees, and supporting seniors every step of the way. Honourable Member for Carleton. The Prime Minister loves to brag about what he calls big, fat government programs. Maybe if he had focused on smart, results-oriented programs, we wouldn't have the highest unemployment rate in the G7, the worst vaccination rate in the G7. And out of 15 countries measured by the McDonald laurie Institute, the 11th were ranked 11th on the COVID misery index. Why did he spend so much to achieve such miserable results for the health and livelihoods of Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I hate to uh, correct the member on his facts, but uh, Japan is a member of the G7. Uh, by taking quick and necessary action, we saved millions of jobs, provided support to millions of families, and kept more businesses solvent. With CERB, with flexible EI, with recovery benefits, with, benefits, with wage subsidy, with rent support, with SIBA. But of course, we hear the Conservatives say we spend too much too quickly. Right. When we turn to recovery, we will regain the jobs lost by making targeted investments, including in training and creating jobs. We knew that the best way through this, this pandemic was to be there for Canadians, and that's exactly what we did. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, congratulations. The Prime Minister knows that Japan is in the G7. Maybe he should also know that Japan has one-tenth the COVID fatality rate of Canada. So let's start judging results. He's delivered the highest unemployment rate in the G7, the worst vaccination rate. And now we find from a scientific and statistical study of health and well being, he has delivered among the highest levels of misery for the biggest price. Why does the Prime Minister judge his success simply by how expensive he can be, not by how many lives he can save? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know this has been a hard year for Canadians and we've all had to look out for each other. We're grateful for Canadians' hard work and resilience and, as we said, we have their backs. We know it hasn't always been easy and we've ensured easy access to digital tools and resources that provide information and support. Wellness Together Canada has provided hundreds of thousands of Canadians with confidential support during the tough times of this pandemic. If anyone needs support, we'll be there for them. The Honourable Member for Carleton. What was that? Is he really going to expect us to believe that when I ask him about having the worst vaccination rates, the worst jobless rate, among the highest misery rate during COVID, the best he can do is stand up and read some talking points that were written for him by his bureaucrats? Why can't he show a little bit of contrition for his failures? This Prime Minister has cost the most to achieve the worst results and what he expects us now to do is to just continue down this failed path. If the Prime Minister wants the confidence of Canadians, will he tell them what will he change to reverse the failures that he has delivered thus far? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I can understand the frustration of the member opposite being amongst the many Canadians who've lost their jobs during this pandemic. The fact is, we have been there to support Canadians every step of the way by investing in families, by investing in workers, by knowing that the best way through this pandemic is to be there to support them. And that is exactly what we have done and what we will continue to do. We've been there for people because we made a simple promise to have their backs as long as it took and as much as it took, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the best way to ensure that our economy comes roaring back after this pandemic. We will continue to be there for the Canadians, regardless of what the opposition says. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, it has been a devastating 12 months for Canadians and sounds like we're going to be in this for another seven months, if not longer. And three million Canadians remain out of work and remain on government support programs. And we know that women's workforce participation has been set back 30 years. So as long as I've been alive, that's how much loss we've had as women in this country. And 100,000 women remain out of work and have not looking for work at all because there are no jobs. So what is the Prime Minister's plan for these three million Canadians and for three million er, and for women? women in Canada.
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have recognized that this recession, this pandemic crisis, is actually a she-session. Vulnerable women, uh, women in all, uh, order, in all uh, socioeconomic levels, have been harder hit by this pandemic than anyone else. Uh, indeed, we know we need to make sure that the losses that we have uh, made in advances uh, the the uh, losses uh, in advances in women's equality that we've suffered this year cannot uh, be any more than temporary. That's why investments in childcare continue to be at the forefront of the intentions of this government. Support for gender equality, support for women's rights is something that this government will never flinch on. Here, here. Honourable member for Kildonan St. Paul. You know, Mr. Speaker, I didn't actually hear a plan for recovery for Canadian women. And this week, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Liberal government praised themselves for establishing a women's task force for recovery an entire year after 1.5 million women lost their jobs in the onset of the pandemic. And I will note that that task force has zero representation for women-dominated industries that were most impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we're talking retail, personal services, accommodation services, mom entrepreneurs, zero representation for them on that task force. It is the Prime Minister's duty to deliver a plan to Canadians of how he's going to bring back jobs and improve things for women. So what is that plan, Mr. Speaker? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the task force we've put forward is going to focus on a, a feminist recovery for our economy, but it's not something we've, the only thing we've done. Uh, a number of years ago, we set up a close to $5 billion winter on, women's entrepreneurship strategy uh, that has let women entrepreneurs succeed right across the country. And we know when women entrepreneurs succeed, uh, they create jobs in the community, they create solutions uh, in the community. We're also committed to moving forward on childcare. As we see the business this community has woken up to the fact that childcare is an economic argument, not just a social argument. And we certainly hope the Conservatives will understand uh, that the extent to which investing in childcare is something we need to do. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my colleague highlighted that economic downturns can have effects that last generations. COVID-19 has seen the greatest exit of women from the workforce in 30 years. All of the progress the Prime Minister just mentioned wiped out a year ago. He has talked about the she session many times over this last year, but all they've done is announced a task force for the future. Why does this government still not have a plan to get women back into the workforce in all sectors and in all regions of this country? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that is simply not true. Yes, we've announced a task force to ensure that women are at the heart of the economic recovery moving forward. In. But throughout this pandemic, we have been there to support women, even through increasing the Canada Child Benefit in supports for, uh, for shelters uh, and uh, victims of uh, domestic violence. We have continued to invest to be there to support women through the Women's Entrepreneurship Strategy. But indeed, one of the most pressing recommendations made by every on how to support women in the workforce is to move forward on childcare. And I look forward to seeing the support of the Leader of the Opposition when we put forward our ambitious plan on childcare. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Prime Minister has a big credibility deficit when he says he's going to protect the French language in Quebec. His own office violated the Official Languages Act by handing over thousands of documents on pandemic management to the health committee in English only. And the act is clear. The government has an obligation to provide bilingual copies of do documents so that they can be tabled in both official languages. So why is the prime minister's office violating the act? Prime minister. The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, what the honorable member is claiming is completely false. We provided thousands of documents as requested, and the committee subsequently received those documents in both official languages. So the process is working correctly. We will always protect our official languages. We will always protect the French language. And unlike the members of the bloc, we will protect it all across Canada. The Honorable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's record speaks for itself. 
Ever since he came out and said he was going to protect the French language in Quebec, he refused to enforce Bill 101 on federally regulated companies. He voted against sufficient knowledge of French to become a citizen of Quebec. And now he's violating the Official Languages Act by handing over thousands of uni unilingual English documents. How can he credibly ask Quebecers to trust him to protect the French language? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the bloc's goal is to undermine Francophones' trust in the Canadian state. But once again, Mr. Speaker, with our reform, we're ensuring that all Canadians, be they Francophones in Quebec, Anglophones in the rest of Canada, Francophones living outside of Quebec, Acadians, or others, so that they can all see themselves reflected in the Official Languages Act. Not only will we strengthen and reinforce official language minority rights, we will also do more for the French language all across the country. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government excels in the art of half measures. It dragged its feet to close the borders, dragged its feet to order vaccines, and now it's dragging its feet to table a budget. The Liberals are delaying tabling the budget, and this is creating even more uncertainty for the provinces. The provinces have stated once again that they need stable, predictable funding for health transfers. When will the Liberals respond? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are here to deliver on Canadians' expectations all across the country. That's why we transferred tens of billions of dollars to the provinces and territories for their health systems, for screening tests, for vaccines, and for uh, support for companies. Eight out of ten of the dollars spent uh, did go to help citizens, and that came from the federal government not from the provinces. So we, we've been there for the provinces, for Canadians, and we will continue to be there as long as it takes. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, our leader has already promised uh, an increase in health, the health transfers. The Prime Minister has dismissed the latest provincial request for this funding out of hand, saying that he'll see what happens after the pandemic. The provinces need the health transfers now. Could the Prime Minister once and for all, commit to increasing the health transfers. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We are still in the midst of an unprecedented health and financial crisis that is affecting all Canadians across the country. From the very beginning of that crisis, we were there for Canadians with financial resources. We were there for the provinces with tens of billions of dollars in help for their health care systems and for the delivery of services. And we will continue to do that. Once this pandemic is over, we will be able to sit down with the provinces and we will increase the health transfer. But that will happen after the pandemic. During the crisis, we will be here to support people with all the resources they need. Calgary knows Hill. Medical experts have written in the prestigious medical journal The Lancet that incomplete vaccination by delaying administration of a second dose of the Pfizer vaccine could cause vaccine-resistant variants. This is sort of analogous to taking the whole course of an antibiotic prescription to prevent antibiotic resistance. The Liberals have ignored the advice of Pfizer, Canadian medical experts, and the World Health Organization in recommending that the Pfizer vaccine doses be given four months apart instead of three weeks. Is the Prime Minister confident that this will not lead to vaccine-resistant variants developing in Canada. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Unlike the member opposite, I listen to our experts and I am confident that our experts uh, know what they are doing. To make sure as many people as possible receive protection from COVID-19, the National Advisory Council on Immunization has recommended second doses can be safely delayed up to four months. Vaccines are safe and effective. All vaccines approved in Canada undergo a thorough independent review, and that NACI guidance uh, on administering vaccines uh, authorized or used in Canada is grounded in science. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Mr. Speaker, for people who are watching, what the Prime Minister is essentially saying is that because he failed to get the Pfizer vaccine into Canada in December, January, and February, like 
many other countries did at very small amounts. Now we're going to have to delay dosing to four months, which is something no other country is doing. So when he's saying he listens to experts, he's actually listening to political advice experts in his office. And this could lead to vaccine resistant variants, as medical experts have said. So is the prime minister confident that his non-data driven decision to space the Pfizer vaccines doses four months apart will not lead to vaccine resistant variants developing in Canada? The right honourable Prime Minister. Well, this is interesting because we've all seen Conservative politicians casting doubt on science, casting doubt on experts, saying the pandemic isn't real, you shouldn't wear masks. It is really concerning to hear that kind of, of uh, suspicion around what scientists and experts say from the Conservative health critic. However, knowing what the Conservative Party's approach is on science, we shouldn't be surprised. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, the Veterans Assistant Deputy Minister told our committee that VAT conducts a gender-based analysis of all its policies and programs. That sounded good. But when the Veterans Ombudsperson asked to see the GBA Plus report on mental health treatment benefits to family members, the department didn't even bother answering her. If VAC officials can't bother to respond to the ombudsperson, how many pleas from veterans are they also ignoring? What will the feminist Prime Minister of Canada do about it? The right honourable Prime Minister. I thank the member opposite for bringing up this important concern. I will be following it up, uh, up on it with the minister uh, to make sure that we are uh, delivering on our commitment as a feminist government. The honourable member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, we now know that the defence minister shut down the military ombudsman when he tried to bring forward allegations of sexual misconduct by General Vance. And we now know the PCO pressured Mr. Walburn to turn over the name of the complainant, and of course he refused. And we now know the PCO then ran him out of his job. And we have the feminist prime minister who's been gaslighting the former military ombudsman for saying he didn't supply enough information. Will the prime minister just do the right thing and apologize to Mr. Walburn? and the woman who had the decency and the dignity to come forward. The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take all allegations seriously and ensure they are followed up upon by the appropriate independent authorities. That's exactly what happened in this situation. After the Defence Ombudsman received a complaint, the Minister directed him to independent officials who could investigate. My office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman. Those officials never received further information and so were unable to move forward with an investigation. The Honourable Member for Brampton North. Mr. Speaker, this week marks the one-year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. This past year has been challenging for every Canadian, and my heart goes out to anyone who has lost a loved one. Governments at all levels have been make, making hard decisions to slow the spread of the virus, but we have been there every step of the way. Can the Prime Minister tell us more about how our government has worked to keep Canadians safe from COVID-19 throughout this year? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Brampton North for her question and for her hard work on behalf of her community. From day one, we've taken action, supported the provinces and territories, and provided billions of dollars to support contact tracing and testing capacity, to deliver millions of rapid tests and billions of items of PPE, and send on-the-ground hotspot assistance through the Canadian Red Cross. We will continue to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, when first asked about General Vance's sexual misconduct, the Prime Minister said he wasn't aware of any allegations. But in last Friday's press conference, he pivoted from any allegations to specific allegations. Is the Prime Minister committed to zero tolerance or only to almost, sort of, zero tolerance? Women in uniform and all Canadians deserve to know. What did the Prime Minister know about misconduct allegations against General Vance, and when did he know it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, anyone who serves in the Canadian Armed Forces or anywhere in government or across the country 
deserves to have a safe work environment, deserves to be supported if they come forward with allegations. And that's exactly what we've always done in every situation. After the Defence Ombudsman received a complaint, the Minister directed him to independent officials who could investigate. My office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman, but my office and I learned the details of the allegations in media reports over the past couple of months. Well, member for Aurora Oak Ridge is Richmond Hill. To understand what the Prime Minister knew about the cover-up of sexual misconduct in the Canadian Forces, the facts matter. The Defence Minister knew in March 2018. Janine Sherman, the Deputy Secretary of Cabinet, knew in March 2018. Michael Wernick, then Deputy Minister to the Prime Minister, and Elder Marquez, a senior advisor to the Prime Minister, also knew. Is it the Prime Minister's position that no one made him aware of the allegations of misconduct against General Vance three years ago? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. My office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman to follow up with appropriate authorities. But my office and I learned the details of the allegations over the past months only. The Honourable Deputy de Chabot, Haute Saint Charles. Monsieur le Président, on voit très bien que le Premier ministre ne veut pas répondre à la question parce que c'est impossible pour nous qu'il n'était pas informé. Excusez-moi, j'ai la traduction. Je vais recommencer, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister lost credibility a long time ago, and now we have even more evidence of that. He has said that he didn't have any information about General Vance, but now we know that the Clerk of the Privy Council was aware of the problem and that the former Ombudsman of National Defence informed the Minister. The Prime Minister promised that he cared about women's causes. Is the Prime Minister trying to have us believe that the Clerk of the Privy Council misled him and that the Ombudsman is lying? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take all allegations very seriously, and we will ensure they are looked at by independent authorities. And that's exactly what happened here. After the Ombudsman of National Defence received a complaint, he was directed to independent civil servants who can carry out an inquiry. My office was aware that the minister had given the Ombudsman this directive. These civil servants didn't, never ended up receiving further information, and thus were not able to carry out an inquiry. My office and myself were made aware of the information as it became available. Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, nobody's buying what the Prime Minister is trying to sell. You know, let's go over what everybody knew three years ago about these serious allegations about General Vance. The Minister of National Defence knew, his Chief of Staff knew, the Clerk of the Privy Council knew, the Deputy uh, Secretary to the Cabinet knew, Elder Marquis, a Senior Advisor to the Prime Minister knew. Yet, the Prime Minister thinks that we're all going to have to believe him but we know he actually did know. But I want to just remind the minister that the deputy secretary to cabinet wrote in a March 16, 2018 briefing note that the ombudsman didn't have the power to investigate sexual misconduct. So the question is, Mr. Speaker, why didn't the prime minister tell his defense minister to do his job and order a board of inquiry? The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, amidst all the political posturing that the Conservatives are playing on this, it's important to remember one fundamental thing. It shouldn't be ministers or politicians investigating allegations. We need independent authorities to rigorously investigate and take seriously any allegations that come forward. And that's exactly what the Minister of National Defence did in this case. The Ombudsman came forward with allegations. The Minister said, you need to take those to independent authorities able to follow up on this investigation. And that is something my office was aware of. L'honorable député de Berthier Masquinonger. The honourable member for Berthier Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois Bill C216 to end loopholes in supply management continues to garner support. Today, the National Assembly of Quebec unanimously requested the federal government to exhaustively protect the supply managed model in future international agreements. The Conservatives have already announced that they will vote against Quebec's unanimous desire and I would invite them to correct things. 
As for the Prime Minister, on behalf of our regions and farms, can farmers count on his support for C216? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadian sectors under supply management are a pillar of our economy. Our government has publicly committed to not making further concessions in trade agreements. And this government will support Bill C-216 at this stage. That will enable the government to further study this important issue. As my honorable colleague underscored, it would be good if our conservative colleagues would also support supply management throughout the country. The honorable member for Avignon, La Métis, Matane, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, this morning the Prime Minister stated that he would not mandate quarantines at land borders because there are no large hotels in La Colle and because there's no way to take action against people who refuse, like there is at the airport. But just like at any other border crossing, there are customs officers in La Colle and they can ask to see a COVID test or ask to see a reservation and tell people to go to a hotel, just like, it's like, just like they do at the airport. They can take action against those who don't respect the law. That's their work. Why won't this Prime Minister take action? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since March, we brought in a quarantine law which has some of the strictest measures in the world for travellers arriving in Canada. We will continue to put into place measures as they become necessary. And at every stage, we will ensure that we are protecting Canadians from new variants, and generally from this virus, a virus that comes from everywhere in the world. We will do everything we can to ensure that people are following quarantine rules and follow health directives. Otherwise, there will be severe consequences. For Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Toronto Star reported that despite the government putting in measures to stop the import of products made with forced labour of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, not a single shipment has been stopped from entering Canada. At the International Trade Committee yesterday, this week, Liberals voted down a Conservative motion to conduct a study to evaluate the effectiveness of these measures, which are clearly not working. Can the Prime Minister tell this House why the Liberals voted down this important study? What are they trying to hide? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we well know, committees are independent and they will continue their work independently. As a government, we will continue to work in close collaboration with our allies to push forward uh, on investigations through international, international independent bodies so impartial experts can access the region so they see firsthand the situation and report back. We are also adopting a comprehensive approach to defending the rights of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities, including measures to address the risk of forced labour from any country from entering Canadian and global supply chains, and to protect Canadian businesses from becoming unknowingly complicit. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, last month this House recognized that China is perpetuating a genocide against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. Yesterday, a coalition of global experts, including two former Liberal Ministers of Justice and a former Liberal Minister of Foreign Affairs, concluded that China is perpetuating a genocide. The government must uphold its responsibility under international law and the 1948 Genocide Convention. When will the government uphold the rules-based international order and recognize a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang province in China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are, of course, aware of this new report and will review it very closely. We remain deeply disturbed by the troubling reports of human rights violations in Xinjiang. And we take allegations of genocide very seriously. We will continue to work in close collaboration with all of our allies to push for not just investigations, but also consequences and an end uh, to these reprehensible behaviours. Uh, we will continue to work as a government uh, to make sure that we are having the maximal impact on the world stage. The Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, le mois dernier... Mr. Speaker, last month, we all understood that the Uyghur situation in China is inhumane and very concerning. In fact, it's a genocide, period. Since then, it's been radio silence. What is the next stage here? Why does the Liberal government say one thing while doing the opposite on the issue of China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, 
On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, we are working closely with our international allies to ensure that we have a concerted approach in order to push back against these genocide allegations and, all the, and the concerns we all have about the Uyghurs. We well know that the best way to change China's behavior and protect these ethnic minorities is to create a group of allies all pushing back. I understand my colleague's concern. It is very important that Parliament take action on this issue, but a government has a major responsibilities, and in order to act, we need to do so with our allies. The Honorable Member for Bo Misisqua. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives unhesitatingly called into question a vaccine procurement strategy that is working. They seem to have trouble taking yes for an answer. We know that asking questions is their work, is their job, rather. When will the doses be delivered? How many? But to cloud the issue intentionally and perhaps mislead Canadians? No, that's not responsible. And it is bad for Canadians. Can the Prime Minister set things straight and give us the facts on these vaccines? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I'd like to thank my colleague for this important, for this important question. And I'd also like to wish her a happy birthday today. For more than a year, our priority has been to create the most diverse and, and exhaustive vaccine portfolio in the world. And the facts show that our plan is working. Eight million doses will be delivered by the end of March. That is two million doses more than our goal. While the opposition tries to cloud the issue in order to score political points, we will remain concentrated on helping Canadians. Lampton. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has said he spoke to President Biden about the Line 5 closure and the critical impact it will have on 50,000 jobs on both sides of the border. Could he update this House as to whether the President said he would intervene to keep Line 5 open? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadian energy workers work hard to power homes on both sides of the border. When I met with the President, I underlined how Canada is a reliable source of energy, contributing to U.S. energy security and economic competitiveness. Ambassador Hillman and our Detroit Consul General are strongly advocating, alongside many other officials, for Line 5's continued operation. Our government supports the continued safe operation of Line 5. We will continue to stand up for Canadian energy interests. Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Oh, Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister tell Canadians what he means when his government says that Line 5 is different than Keystone XL? Is it different because the Minister of Natural Resources is paying more attention this time? Is it different because he might actually engage the U.S. administration on this issue? Is it different because it involves Canadian jobs outside of Western Canada? Keystone XL's cancellation represents the loss of thousands of Canadian jobs and billions of dollars of economic value to our country. So does Line 5. So what is different this time? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we did for many, many years, we continued to advocate for Keystone XL up until the moment uh, when a final decision was made. Uh, we are continuing to advocate for Line 5 and will continue to uh, because we know how important it is to Canadian energy and, and energy workers. Uh, we also have continued to be there for workers in the oil patch, whether it was by uh, purchasing the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion in order to ensure that it gets built, uh, whether it was investing uh, billions of dollars for uh, orphan wells, uh, whether it's by standing up uh, for Canadian energy workers and a brighter future we're building together, we will continue to be there to demonstrate that we know the future must include oil, oil and gas workers in uh, Alberta and across the country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has let thousands of Canadian families down twice with Keystone XL. Talks have broken down between the government, uh, governor of Michigan and Enbridge on Line 5. 30,000 jobs are on the line. It's two months before the deadline, and the Prime Minister today just confirmed he didn't specifically raise Line 5 with the President. The Minister and officials told committee that they're happy that there's now a meteor, mediator in place. Can the Prime Minister tell us why his plan is to bet 30,000 Canadian jobs on an American-appointed mediator. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I think Canadians saw over the past four years that as a government we were consistently able to stand up for Canadian interests even against a very challenging American administration. I can assure Canadians that despite the fear-mongering going on from the Conservatives, we will continue to stand up for American jobs, uh, for Canadian jobs and Canadian interests throughout uh, our work in, uh, as government. Uh, we will continue to be effective in advocating for Canadians. Canadians every step of the way as we successfully did while they play cheap political games. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, today I'm happy to hear that the community of Anishinaabeg Hujshikoknikam Nation is celebrating the lift of their long-term water advisory. This lift means that over 400 community members will access to clean, safe, drinking water. Mr. Speaker, ensuring clean drinking water for First Nations on reserve is a deeply important commitment our government has made. Can the Prime Minister please update the House on where our government is at on fulfilling this important commitment? It right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Nickel Belt for his question. Today marks a historic milestone in our partnership with First Nations communities. We have now lifted 101 long-term drinking water advisories since coming into office. In 2015, there were 105 long-term water advisories with no tracking mechanisms. Now, with our investments and these lifts, over 450,000 First Nations people will have access to clean drinking water. We remain committed to lifting all remaining advisories and investing in long-term solutions so that no, generation, no other generation will grow up without clean drinking water. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. I have a document that shows the Chinese Communist Party is at the heart of Canada's visa application center in China. The subcontractor doing this work is a company owned by the Beijing Municipal Security Bureau. Under Chinese regulations, the chair of the company is the same person as the party secretary, and the general manager is the deputy secretary. They must execute the will of the party in performing their duties and swear an oath to never betray the party. If the prime minister doesn't think a Chinese state-owned company should supply x-ray machines for embassies, why should we trust the Chinese Communist Party to run and operate Canada's visa application centres in China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that all third-party contractors undergo rigorous screening. Officials regularly carry out inspections and audits to ensure compliance with Canada's privacy standards, most recently in just December of last year. The number of a number of countries also use the same local provider, including a number of Five Eyes allies. We will, every step of the way, continue to ensure the safety and the integrity of our visa application system. 